If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. <laughs> 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 Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. America. I'm not saying that there isn't some possibility, but in my experience, um, you know, somebody may have a grandmother who's a witch or something and put a curse on them. Okay, guys, welcome back to Grammar Eric Show. We are going to be chatting with real life demon slayer Dr. Richard Gallagher a little bit later. He's also a psychiatrist, but, uh, you know, he's a, also a demon slayer. Well, I don't know. I don't think he would agree with that. He doesn't really do the exorcisms, right? So you got to be careful about calling him that. He doesn't. Well, he's, he's no, still. No, like, he's, seen, he's seen the most out of any doctor that's living right now, he thinks, but. He's he's more of like a partner in it, like an investigator, a partner. He doesn't really do the thing. He doesn't slay. He's on the demon slaying team. Yeah, he's on the team. Okay. He's on the team. Yeah. Yeah. He might not be the actual slayer. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I did my, uh, I just finished my exam. For work, I had to do a welding, just a welding exam for bureaucratic purposes. Okay. And, uh. It's the first time I've done this online thing. Right. You mean, so it's usually you would have gone into a class and did it like at the welding bureau yeah, or whatever. Yeah, all the right? other yeah, ones right. I've done, I had to go in and be like a couple of days of going to class and then you do an exam at the end. And I had the option of that for this one, I think too, but I just, it was all out of town. So I opted just to do the exam and then I couldn't get in for like 45 days or something unless I did it online, then I could get in right away. So I did this online and right the, today I went to test my machine for the exam requirements and it picked up that I had three monitors. Said that was no good. I can only have two. What? What? Whoa, 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 wait a second. You're testing your machine, not your welding machine. You're like your my computer, computer? my computer machine. Cause they're worried. Maybe I guess someone else is listening and maybe one of my, so maybe I don't know, or I'm Googling shit on the other screen. So, I had to, I tried shutting them but off, it's an that open, But it's an open book test. Though. Yeah, but only for the manual. You can only look at the manual. <sighs> so I tried shutting them off, not good enough. I have to like rip my computer out of the desk and physically disconnect two monitors. So the, you only had the one monitor that you're, were you on Zoom? Or were you in some other Google this Meet? Is, it was some like weird. Their own their proprietary own, thing? Their or? own proprietary sort of system. So then I had to hook up the webcam. And I had to, I had a cup of coffee. So she's like, uh, I had to show her the desk where I was going to be working. So, uh, cause I'm in my new studio. Now that Graham has, we've stopped doing the in-studio thing. So I've got a smaller space studio in my room now. Um, so let us know how the audio is. Anyway, I had to show the desk. Uh, so she could see all the stuff on my desk. She made me remove my cup of coffee. I couldn't have the cup of coffee. I had to take the camera, put it, shine it under my desk. I had to take my phone and put it on the bed behind me. I had to be at least six feet away. I had to show her where I put it. Did she make any comments about how messy your room is? <laughs> my room's pretty clean. <laughs> um, so then I had to go and spin the camera around 360 degrees so she could see everything in the room. And she made me cover up my extra monitors with towels. Wow. That's, that's good. That's pretty good. I mean, that's, uh, that's a lot of, uh, and then as far as I'm, I know she must've had to like, I had to keep my webcam on the whole time and screen share the whole time. So I think that lady had to sit there for an hour and a half and watch me go through this manual and answer all these questions and screen share. Cause you're going through a manual electronically though, or yes. 
Oh, that's creepy. So they're and watching first, you go yeah, through yeah, the open yeah, yeah. book, like. And then, so then, first, I had to give her control of my mouse. She took remote control of it. What? And went through to check like all my stuff to make sure I didn't have any secret tabs open or anything like that. It was crazy. This is for a welding exam. For a welding supervisor's exam. Oh my god! What I I mean, really? Are they? Are, is this? Well, I'm I'm in shock. I I just after all the things you can get away with these days, they're they're really concerned about a welding exam. I mean, what are they? Is it really like that much it, of a risk of people cheating? Know, to right? Get this? It's crazy. I can't believe it. I couldn't believe all the hoops she made me jump through. But anyway, I'm done. I passed. I but have you have to shave again. your mustache off too. I mean, no mustaches. I had to show her my ID. <laughs> You're like, hey, I'm an Indian. I shouldn't have to go through all this yeah, stuff. Just get, just send I, me my know. fucking card. <laughs> so it's cold as fuck. Do you go outside yet? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I just want to say something quickly uh, about the intro here. So this is where we just ramble a little bit. We go through some listener stuff, some some segments of our own stuff prior to the uh, to the episode with Richard. Um, so Darren puts a, a timestamp in the, in the show notes uh, just so people can skip ahead if they want to get right into the interview. Oh. Yeah, it's cold, dude. Yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's pretty gross. It's like minus. Close to down to minus 36 overnight. Uh, That's a hell well, of a Well, I mean, so I'm, I, I didn't want to get into too many personal stories and stuff here in this intro, but I mean, Maria is trying to get a flight back from Saskatoon and it's a disaster. Like one flight's canceled because of lack of crew. And then the second flight's delayed. They got a bigger plane in there and they're like, look, even if the plane shows up, that doesn't mean it's going to go. So, I mean, everything is up in the air with WestJet. It seems in Canada during this cold. Cause I mean, who knows if they have the right, if they have the people in the airport working or, you know, it's probably not only airplane crews, but who wants to go outside in minus 30 degrees weathers now? And they probably have they probably have the ability to say, no, I'm not coming in today because what are they going to do? They probably short staffed everywhere. Yeah, they're probably not in the position to do anything about it. If people yeah. don't. Come. I mean, I still personally have a hard line in the sand on certain things. If a guy's missing too much work, get rid of him right away because that sort of thing spreads around. Yeah, and you got you got your three months or whatever on probation and on most in most positions. So yeah. you got, you do have to totally utilize that for sure. Uh, you know, bad attitudes spread. You keep your eye on that kind of stuff. Yeah, but it's hard to get rid of people in across all sectors, right? Now. Everyone I've talked to in every sector. Who was I talking to? Oh yeah, so I dropped that pig off at the butcher. So shout out to Sanford. I know he listens to Outlawed more, but shout out to Sanford who. I had the pig killing experience with. I don't know if I talked about that on the show yet. You haven't. No, I haven't even heard it uh, personally. So, so I went there and uh, drove three and a half hours up, and um, and of course it took us forever to get out of here with the kids. So we didn't get up there till late. Sh- shot the pig, and shot uh, it. Shot it. Yeah, and wow. uh, it took a minute to like get the fucking guts out of that thing, man. It was crazy. Was it uh the pig was probably was it 900 old? Pounds. Was it old? Was it old? Like, was like was three? It time to go? Like Yeah, it was time to go. Okay. Pig was probably 900 pounds. When I took it to the butcher after I took the heads off, the hooves off, the skin off and the guts out. It was 602 pounds. Holy, wow. I think there's about 400 and some pounds of pork in the freezer downstairs. Let me know if you need any pork. But anyway, um, what was the point of that story? Well, you're talking about the kill, you know, the guts that were coming out of it and stuff, and how how hard it was to gut compared. It was to way you. harder to gut than a deer or anything else. There's so much fat on those motherfuckers, and they're like really ripped in there. It was something else. It was something else. How was it relevant to what we were talking about, though? Um, about the cold, maybe. I feel like it was just a, maybe I think it was just a shout out to Sanford. Oh, that's right. Yeah, shout out to Sanford. Yeah. So shout out to Sanford. Thanks, buddy. I will uh we will meet again soon and I will have some pork for you. 
And speaking of uh, him listening to Gray America Outlawed, man, have we ever got a lot of good feedback about our show with Kay Yang. I'm not going to say a lot about it in detail here in this intro, but we have a whole separate podcast called Gray America Outlawed. It's a different feed. It's a different format. It's like two hours, more, way more controversial. And man, did people, people really like that chat we had with Kay Yang. So head over there and check out our other show if you want. GrayAmericaOutlawed.ca, right? That's right. That's right, Great America Outlaw.c. We encourage people to check that out. There's over 100 shows over there now. So, I mean, it's worth your time if you haven't checked it out yet to go check it out now. And uh, big big shout out to listeners for, for reviews. We got some new reviews because I was bitching about that one-star review we got from that, from that uh, uninformed uh, listener calling <laughs> us uninformed hosts. Did you read and that on the show? That, that review, yeah. Did it have the whole thing? Yeah, I read the whole thing. Yeah, he never did tell what he what he was pissed at us for. Well, that's what that's what my point was. Like, dude, it's it felt like a troll. It felt like oh, remember because it was on the one format, but it wasn't in the actual review. So I was like, who's just putting this straight into the third party review system? That's why I was kind of like, it was part of my conspiratorial take on it as well. We got a few offset. We appreciate that. We could always use a few more. We could use like. Uh, you know, it'd be good to do a 10 to 1 on the... Uh, on the one star. On the one star. So if we get a few other people to head over to... I don't know if Android has a review system. I only see the iTunes one as far as I know. Review us over there. If there's a place to review us on on uh, <clears throat> Android, review us there too. I don't think Android has like a, a main space like iTunes has for, you know? But there might be. Yeah. Prove me wrong. Tell me, too. I'd like to know if there is. That's the kind of thing I'd like to promote. Huh. So what I do you agree. got? You got anything good Well, I mean, I got, I got a long listener email about our last episode uh, about some dreams. I'd like to talk about that, maybe, but it's quite long. Um, and then I got a, pro- a quick project op- uh, operation uh, in relation to the Vatican, I guess, and maybe, like, kind of more indirectly related to the show that we're doing the intro for right now with Dr. Richard Gallagher. The oppo? What do you want to do yeah. first? Um, uh, whatever you want. The oppo is fine. The oppo is an easier jingle to find. And I mean, it's not a super controversial one. I mean, I was looking it up when I was researching for this, for the intro, I came across Dave Zed, one of his YouTube uh, shows that was about like secret underground Vatican stuff, and and uh, but it was removed off of YouTube. I don't know if he took it like into his subscriber base or something, but it's funny how I kept coming up with Dave Zed stuff when I was searching for this. But I did find. Okay, go ahead and, and play your jingle. To me, definitely military, probably classified too. I turned up the wrong fader. Sentry Eagle, Sigma, Mannerkin, Artichoke, MK Ultra. Operation Project. Project Operation. So this is um this is from I, I mean there's a whole bunch of different articles on this, but so it's kind of hard to choose the decent one. But this is from To Be Free. Dot press and it's back from 2013 you probably remember this so this is like it's almost 10 years ago now when we started the show even um the vatican observatory launches the lucifer telescope and do you remember we did a show not too long ago where somebody was confirming that, that like this is a real thing right and it, it kind of has to do with this episode because in the episode i questioned dr richard gallagher's like, how do we define what's sort of a cult and what's, you know, neo-pagan or neo-shamanism? And 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 I'm going to rant about this now, I guess. So, because this is kind of like what Blavatsky warned us about, too. It's like, don't practice all this stuff unless you've done your work, right? Unless you're sort of, uh, unless you've sort of been trained in this. And in some ways, maybe she meant initiated. And that's really not what Dr. Gallagher is saying. But he says a lot of these uh, demon possessions, whether they're, the th- whether they're the three things he mentions, which is possessions, oppression, or infest- infestation, that a lot of times they come from people playing around in the occult, right? Whether it's like Ouija boards or like literally sa- satanic things or 
or just like he says, neo paganism or neo shamanism, and and that all these things are kind of risky. So I was thinking, like, well, where where do we draw the line on this, right? Like angel work, shamanism, tarot, astrology, Reiki, and energy healing, psychedelics, yoga, prayer, spiritualism, different types of magic, and of course. Like we need to separate black magic and the Ouija board and stuff like that. But, you know, I think we need at some point, not us, but to draw, to figure out what's, what's it, what's risky and what's okay to do here. Because, you know, from a, and I didn't mention to him about paganism as far as like, there's a pretty white side of paganism, not white, like white as in white magic. Like you, you can't call that evil or black magic. You know, it's funny. I didn't mean what I literally just listened to um, Art Bell. Someone said, say, uh, so you're a white witch. I don't mean oh. skin color. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny because that's I, when I said that, I was like, yeah, I, I don't mean skin color. I mean, so. And but a lot of it is just connecting back to nature, right? Like there's a lot of it that's just nature based. You know, you want to get back to that animism of nature that everything's sort of alive and you're connected to it. I mean, what? How can that be in any way like lead to some evil possession type thing? It's so I don't know why I, I kind of went on that round. I guess because they named their thing Lucifer, so that's the controversy, right? So the Vatican launches this Lucifer telescope, and the Vatican's astonishing exotheological plan for the arrival of an alien savior. And, and Lucifer is, means light being? Well, it, more, the, the, the uh, what is it? The star, the morning star, the morning star itself. Name, it's a name for the devil whose name itself means morning star. Um, I, I don't want to get into the details of exactly what that means because uh, there's a bunch of different sort of interpretations Hate. of it now right you know all right i'm sorry and i don't even it. know what i think but a after a decade of design manufacturing and testing the new instrument dubbed lucifer um, provides a powerful tool to gain insights into the universe um and and they've got an an an, an acronym it's an acronym for something which is actually kind of it's a lame sort of acronym i don't think i have uh what it, oh, it stands for Large Binocular Telescope Near Infrared Utility with Camera and Integral Field Unit for Extragalactic Research. They're and trying yes, to convince us that they're looking at shit in other galaxies. Yeah. And yes, it's uh, and they focus on certain stars and stuff and watch these specific stars. And it says, and yes, it's named for the devil whose name itself means morning star and which happens to be right next to the Vat Vatican Observatory on Mount Graham in Tucson. Mount oh, Graham. Yeah. Associated with Lucifer. So, yeah, there we have it. I'll just there. put a link to that in the show notes. It's pretty, I don't want to get into too many details about it, but it is, it is true. I mean, it is a thing. It's, and yeah. It's a thing. <laughs> it's a thing. Have we played the housekeeping jingle yet? I forget what it sounds like. I'm going to play it. Okay. Housekeeping. 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 Time for us to handle law business on the ground. America's show. Little bit louder now. Housekeeping segment. A little long. Anyway, we will get to some housekeeping. We do need some support. Now more than ever, Christmas coming up with inflation and everything else. The PayPal fiasco of 2022, we're still, you know, recovering from oh, that. Oh, right. Yeah, right. Cost us, you know, somewhere between 15 and 20% of our support back then. We had more cancellations in like a week than we ever have had in the history of the show. Or maybe we just released an episode and it sucked. I mean, if we suck, tell us about that too. But we produce a show here. We think it's worth something. Head over to Great America ca slash support if you think the show is worth something let us know what it's worth to you you can either make a monthly we you know monthlies are great one-time donations are great you have both options right there at the bottom of the page if you do hate paypal there's a stripe option right there at the bottom of the page and also if i'm not mistaken we do still take crypto so i don't think anyone's ever really given us crypto yet Maybe it's not on well, the page. It's probably best. Well, they don't. I mean, I we're don't not know. great, but I was thinking we're I would not, just stash it in Bitcoin, like uh, yeah, yeah, what's for his sure. Name says. Yeah, like Al from Forum Borealis says. Yeah, 
Yeah. Because we did just have that. We got a lot of people liked the show we had with those guys over on GrammaricaOutlaw.ca. So. That's uh, the, the episode before K Yang's, which was called the Alt Media United episode. That was great. Yeah. So GrammaricaOutlaw.ca slash support, guys, if you can. The other thing I will mention in the housekeeping segment is we do have that tour coming up with uh, we're with Greg Carlson of the higher Greg, Car- Carlwood. Greg, Carlwood, Greg Carlwood of the higher side of chats and Owen Hunt, Joe Roop, Brandon Powell. We're gonna have a great time over at Mount Shasta. The more people are starting to pick up tickets for that, so we encourage you guys to come out for that. I think our buddy Kevin Owls is gonna come up for it and say hi. Maybe a little party van action. That is the van that I jumped off of and hurt my ankle, so I won't be going anywhere near the roof of that motherfucker. But having a contact at thecabin.com, you'll see the event right there, Magic on the Mountain. Click on that. Grab yourself a spot. You know, we've got spots of all levels left. So you can check that out. We encourage you to come. It's going to be a blast. This is going to be a fantastic event. I've never been to Shasta. Um, you know, if California is one spot I'd like to check out other than the coast, that's probably it. Actually, Yosemite would be on that list as well. And then we have the 420 Bash coming up in Utah this year as well. So those are all over at the Contact at the Cabin page, as long as our Randall Carlson events. Go ahead, check that shit out. Yeah, yeah, totally. The best part about those is just the people, right? The people that are there. It's amazing. But the, but the especially the magic one, it's going to be almost like a live podcast. We're going to get to see Owen and Joe and then do Brandon Powell's Breathwork and Ice Plunges. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And Carl would, of course. Almost like a, it's almost like a weekend long podcast in a way. That's right. It's going to be fantastic. Please do it. We could use more people for that Shasta one and we could like really blow it off the walls. Have a great yeah. time over there before that. Higher side chats. I think uh, Brandon and I are going to go on the higher side chat scene and we'll be pumping it over there. So if you're on the fence, that'll probably, you know, blast a lot of tickets out. So sign up today. Any other housekeeping you can think of? Spam gram? Yeah, send me emails. Yeah. Feedback and synchronicities, your stories, all kinds of stuff, whatever you want. Speaking of which, do you have one? Well, I do. I, I would like to read this actually. It's it's pretty long, but it, and it and it's in some ways it's in, it's interesting in, in terms of this uh demonic possession thing as well. Because some people do think there's a relation between ETs and AI and demons. Spam Graham, Graham. Hey, Graham and Darren, Lewis here. I wanted to share you with you, gents, an experience that is adjacent to your podcast on Grays and AI with Danielle Silverman. These were a pair of dreams I had a year or two ago around this time of the year. Both dreams were remarkably identical, something that never happens for me. I've never experienced a recurring dream. I sat up from my bed with the feeling that there was an intruder outside my house. As I walked down the hallway with a feeling of adrenaline and defensive instinct on high alert, I noticed my house was very solid, as it is in the waking, almost as if I was in a haze more than dreaming not a typical morphing landscape that characterizes dreams. I get to the bathroom, which is on the second floor overlooking the entrance and see that there's a tall gray alien outside looking up at me. It was somewhat gangly and had a hunched posture, probably standing around 5'10". I could sense a feeling of searching curiosity from the being, and it was devoid, really, of emotion. At this point, I made it clear to them that they needed to get out of here now. So I don't know why he, he switches to they. Unless that's the preferred pronoun the thing wanted to be referred to as, but so maybe there was more than one, um, and that they that they were not welcome. I was really yelling at them and aiming my shotgun at them, sending them anger. They took the hint and buggered off dispassionately, and with relief, I went back to sleep. Fast forward a few months, I get a second dream, same as before. I wake with the feeling of an uninvited presence at my door. Sitting up in bed, I was. It was the same feeling as the previous dream. I look out my window, and in the sky, there's four or five colored lights lined up vertically. It would look very similar if you looked at a Western chakra diagram. I remember blues, reds, greens, and one of them was a whitish lit cube that was rotating around. Ooh, that's interesting. There's a lot of cube cube orbs, like cubes within orbs that are rotating around that their people are seeing now as UFOs sometimes a black cube inside of a white orb. 
Double blackie, where, a black and a white. Where was I? Yang yeah. Yang. Yeah, maybe I like that. Yeah. Um, so I so I begin walking down the hallway on the first floor with a sense of high alert, noting that my house was again very solid and unlike a dream house. As I walk towards the front entrance, I see there are two beings waiting on the sun porch for me. This is curious because they have had to open the porch doors to enter, but they hadn't fully come into the house. As I get right to the front door, my mood turns from defensive to welcoming. As I get a better sense of who they were, I was happy to see them and invited them inside. They were both white men, one taller at about six foot and the other shorter one about being five, six. As I was chatting with them, having a good time, I became aware of their hologram type projection fading, and they appeared as what I would call an Assassani. Assassani. I've attached a picture below, but they looked as if a gray alien, but full of color, iridescent light and dark green with colors as a mallard's green coat and more. Their eyes as well were a darkish bluish, per perhaps, giving off that iridescent purples and were full of beauty. I could tell the taller being was uncomfortable that knowing that I could see them, but I tried reassuring them that it didn't bother me. I was in just intrigued. But they shifted back to a human appearance, and I had no desire to probe them and let them appear as they fit, as they were uh, comfortable. Anyway, we were carrying on with our conversation, having a great chat, and was full of good cheer, friendliness, and humor. At some point, the two beings became three or four, and one of them was very short, perhaps under five feet, and we were all around enjoying the company. This whole meeting was to last about five or ten minutes. And then it was their time to go, and we had our fa farewells, and they were off, and I returned to sleep. So he says, uh, I've heard stories about gray aliens before being a race that tinkered with their DNA and damaged it, perhaps being humans from the future and had some relationship with humans, perhaps an agreement, perhaps not, of taking on human DNA to repair theirs. And having heard that Essasani are gray aliens whose DNA was healthy, perhaps on a timeline that never modified their genome or had it successfully healed. Contrasting these two dream encounters, it was so plain to me that the Essasani beings were full of good emotion, very friendly, warm-hearted, kind, and che cheery. They were certain, he says cheeky, I don't know if he means cheeky or cheery. There were certainly people I would enjoy meeting again, and I hold our visit as one of the more pleasant visitation experiences. Thank you both for all the storytelling podcasts you put out. I enjoy listening to your chats and love following along. Hope you found this intriguing. You're welcome to share on the pod. It's a bit long, though. Cheers from NC, Lewis. And he's got an attachment of this art by Hybrid Arts, and it's of the Assassini. And it's like a gray, a gray alien with sort of gray hair, but uh, uh, greenish and yellow. Like it's more of a colorful picture with these gray dots on his head. It's kind of. Kind of creepy looking, really. Creepy? Yeah. Great. So thanks. Yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks for thanks. the emails. Send more emails. We need them. Did we already do the Opoly? We did, right? Yeah, I got another email um, uh, Ooh, that I'd like to read from. Uh, this is from uh, our fellow who's, uh, I believe he's in the UK, and he's following along from beginning to end. And he's only, he's still less than halfway through the episodes. But he's he's sort of joined our chats somehow. Have we had the chats for that long? Anyways, he was like, uh, not sure if you're getting these messages. Um, but I'm still sending them anyway, because that's what the UK posse does. If we're still around, as I'm only still on episode 220. So not so sure how things are going at the moment. But I thought I'd let you know I tried the waterworks thing that a lady on your show was talking about. I think it was the woman who saw a shaman turn into a panther. So I lost all confidence in her at that moment or at that point, but tried it anyways to cure a lump under my eyes and a painful knee, both of what I had for years and are now gone. And I only had to try it a few times for each thing when laying in bed before going to sleep, which really impressed me. I will let you know if I managed to cure anything else with it. And maybe someone else can try and make sure I'm not crazy. Well, I better get back to my eight or nine hours of daily Grimerica. I don't think I'll be finished by Christmas, so I may have to sign up for a monthly before that disappears, like like the buck of month option. I hate being behind. Love all your stuff. Keep it up, guys. Lots of love from the UK. And then I sort of emailed him back just saying, yeah, we're getting your messages. And he says, uh, 
That's awesome. I never thought I would get red on the show. I'm now looking forward to catching up even more. I haven't been on any of your socials, but I did join the one on the website the other day, and I think it was something like matter most, and I seemed like it was a load of dad jokes, which made me chuckle. I'm currently 229 episodes in. I feel like I'm slowing down, but I think it's just where you had a few of those episodes over three hours long this week, which is always nice, especially if it's topping up to the all the Randall you can handle. So he's talking about our Randall Carlson episodes from the early 200s. We had grandamerica.ca slash hangout. So so far, you guys have kept pretty true to your roots. I haven't oh, noticed shit. much change. I'm sure Darren has probably run the numbers and put an estimate on when I'm when I'll be caught up, but I only have one more week of work until I'm done for the new year, but I'll try to catch up a few hours a day. He says, My bad about the buck a month thing. I obviously didn't tap on it right. And I have seen that I will set up a monthly donation to help you guys pay the bills and hopefully not have to work if you haven't got there already. Have a great Christmas from the UK Posse. We did. So have, we were still on. We were still on Google Hangouts back then. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. But maybe now he's. I forgot. Like he's gone to the website, which which leads to Mattermost now, right? So yeah, yeah. Matt, it goes to Mattermost or uh, or Telegram. We don't or have Discord. Telegram on there yet. We have Discord, and of course, I got kicked off Twitter. We already talked about that. Did we talk about that? Well, yeah. I mean, are you kicked off or? Well, it's, they haven't they haven't reinstated you yet. They've definitely not reinstated me yet. And when I go okay. to the page, it says uh, your account is permanently suspended. After careful review, we determined your account broke the Twitter rules. Your account is permanently in read only mode which means you can't tweet, retweet, or like content. You won't be able to create new accounts. If you think we got this wrong, you can submit an appeal. But I submitted my appeal a couple times now, and I've never heard back. All right. Yeah, we don't have to get into that. No, we, we don't need to get into it. It's, just, it's a real shame. Yeah. So I have the new one, Grand Americano. You want to follow me there. So there's also a Telegram. Um, you can find links to that in the show notes. Um, and we'll we'll end up making the web. I guess we'll make it uh, on the website at some point. But yeah. Yeah. Telegram is easy because people. you can just search Grammarica and we'll come right up. Oh, okay. Cool. That's the beauty about our terrible SEO. It's great SEO if you know what you're, if you know you're looking for If you for know us. what you're looking for. It, yeah. All so right. That's guys. about it. You have a bio? I do have a bio. And I want to mention, oh, no, I, I've already mentioned all that. So. Yeah, so Richard Gallagher, uh, MD, uh, board certified psychiatrist, professional psychiatry at New York Medical, and a psychoanalyst of the faculty of Columbia University. Graduated from Princeton, Phi Beta Kappa in classics, trained as a resident in psychiatry at Yale School of Medicine. The world's foremost scientific expert on the subject of diabolic attacks. He's been an active member of the International Association of Exorcists since the 90s. He lives in Westchester, New York. His new book is Demonic Foes, My 25 Years as a Psychiatrist Investigating Possessions, Diabolic Attacks, and the Paranormal. And I put a link to HarperCollins here. I could not find a link to the Griffin Press signed copies. Sorry about that, but uh, start with HarperCollins, I guess. And um, he also loves history, so... It's a, it's, he's got a lot of, uh, historical evidence in there as well. There you have it. There you have it. Well, we hope you guys enjoyed our lazy ramblings and more than that. We hope you enjoy the chat with Dr. Richard Gallagher.
Dr. Gallagher, welcome to Grimerica. Thanks for joining us. Well, uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm excited to talk to you about this. I mean, it's uh, it's such a complex it's such a complex topic. I'm I'm really looking forward to digging this into this with you because we we talk about this often on the show and not from a real dogmatic angle, but your book is called uh, let me just read the whole title here. Demonic Foes: My 25 Years as a Psychiatrist Investigating Possessions, Diabolical Attacks and the Paranormal. And uh, I think you did a really balanced nuanced job on this which is i think very important at so many levels you know that so yeah i guess let's let's talk let's start from like a little bit about the beginning like why why sort of write this book as being a psychiatrist you know you're in this in this field with uh all kinds of uh you know science and also uh you know parapsychology kind of kind of stuff why why would you want to write this book well, I, I wrote it for a few different audiences. I basically wrote it because after so many years of experience dealing with these kind of cases, both true cases and what I call false cases, um, that I, I really thought I should speak to the public about it. You know, I'm a, I am a professor of psychiatry, and so um, I used to have an academic chairman who actually encouraged my studying these things. And he wrote the preface to my book. He was a former president of the American Psychiatric Association, so he was a pretty pretty uh, established guy, smart guy. And he basically said, you know, Dr. Gallagher has seen more cases of possession than any physician in the world. Um, I'm sure that's true. And in fact, if you think about it with Zoom and with... These are not patients of mine, by the way, but with with Zoom, with telephone calls and all that, I actually think I've seen more cases of possession, true possession, which are rare, nevertheless. But I've seen more of those cases probably than any physician in history. Um, So I figured, hey, I ought to share my thoughts on the topic to people who are interested, and there are many people who are involved in this field who who, who are very interested in buying the book, uh, Demonic Foes, but also for the educated public, you know, guys like yourself, thoughtful people who, you know, maybe have an open mind about it. Well, I mean, I have I have a million questions for you. Um, I, I like the way you sort of distinguish the different levels of, let's say, demonic possession and the way you talk about how this is real, but it's rare. And there's a whole bunch of this other sort of noise that you have to teach through. And what kind of triggered me a little bit, I don't know if we should wait and get into that later on, but it, and not tr- trigger is not the right word either, but um, you talk about people's experiences with the occult or paganism, for example, seems to be a way that people get drawn into, into this uh, phenomena. So I don't know if we should tease that apart yet, or maybe you can talk about the levels of demonic possession and sort of what you found that makes you think some of this is really real, but there's also a whole bunch of stuff that you've sort of teased apart. Maybe we can start with that. Yeah, I mean, real quick on, on the occult and that sort of stuff. Uh, these are the people who tend to get, attacked. You know, this is not just going to happen to your average Joe. Um, Paganism is a complicated subject. Uh, And, you know, I'm a great lover of history. I studied classics at Princeton. And, you know, I admired a lot of pagan cultures, the Greek and Roman cultures. Uh, Neo-paganism is a slightly different thing. So you get people who kind of have rebelled against traditional religion. Um, that's kind of the modern pagan movement, uh, which is really what I was also talking about in the book. Um, it's, it's very important to keep in mind that, um, you know, as a psychiatrist, I mean, uh, like every psychiatrist, I'm seeing, I'm seeing people who imagine that they're attacked by spirits or hear, hear demonic voices and they, it's, you know, a kind of brain pathology and they just think it's, um, caused by some kind of a demonic attack. And there have been other medical illnesses throughout history, let alone things like uh, seizure disorders, where people have imagined or hypothesized that this was caused by by demons. I don't believe that for a minute. So the cases I, I write about are fairly rare. 
But if you look at the total evidence in history, it's not so rare. Uh, and I originally uh, wrote, was asked to write an article for the Washington Post, and it was interesting that the editor said to me, well, just talk about your experience as a psychiatrist getting involved with this. Don't give me any evidence. So, of course, the comments to the article was, um, Dr. Gallagher, why don't you give us the evidence? So that's what I tried to do uh, in the book. And you have to make these distinctions between possessions, which are very rare, and they're, they might be defined as a evil spirit, which I absolutely believe in, uh, evil spirits um, controlling, taking control of the person's uh, body, essentially, uh, consciousness, versus lesser attacks, which which may involve things like physically attacking victims without without possessing them with those those we use, people use different terminology but in the book i used the, the the standard sort of north american term of oppressions um and those are the two major attacks there when 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 people have very weird dark phenomena attacking a place like a house like a haunting uh, those we those we call infest infestation. So those those are the major categories that I write about. Would would uh, incubus and succubus style attacks be considered uh, oppressions then? Well, they could occur. They could occur, and and trust me, I've heard about that sort of thing. Uh, I mean, people report that it's very painful. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I mean, we've talked. That's the one thing because there's, it happens to people that we're close to. So, it, you know, it's it's one of those things. That I, I, it does it fall into this category? You know, it usually indicates a more serious attack. And in fact, uh, I think that uh, it's more characteristic of uh, uh, possession, uh, a genuine possession. Uh, now, of course. I am a psychiatrist. I'm a believer in science. You know, I believe in the Big Bang Theory, and I believe in evolution. I'm a scientifically trained guy. And science, in a modern sense, uh, meaning materialist science, which has its place, is always going to find some alternative explanation, even for things like incubus. They're going to say, well, these people are psychotic or... Sleep paralysis. This is sleep paralysis. Yeah, I can see you know your, you know your stuff. So uh, all these things people will try to explain away. But what I, what I tell people is, look, even though I have not seen it, I have talked to about 35 sort of very honest salt-of-the-earth people who have either witnessed, including a European professor that I know, they've either witnessed or uh, experienced themselves uh, a levitation, uh, or they have seen people speak in perfect Latin. And, and the point I make to my colleagues is, look, how many psychiatric patients do you know who have levitated or all of a sudden start speaking a foreign language fluently that they've never studied. So that's the kind of evidence. And and the evidence varies from person to person for a possession, but it, there has to be very clear evidence. I'm not, I'm not sort of intuiting or guessing. And the church itself, and I am a Catholic, I, 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 I I don't work for the church. The church doesn't speak for me or vice versa, but I've tended to work mostly with Christian clergy, although it occurs in every religion, by the way. And um, at least in the Catholic church, they're, they're very rigorous about making these discernments. And sometimes, you know, sometimes they need my help. Uh, can you talk about a couple times where you've, where somebody's come to you or they've passed on a client to you and you've, and you've sort of sussed out pretty quick that this isn't a real possession? Oh, oh, definitely. I mean, uh, and again, these are not clients of mine. They're not patients of mine. They're people I'm doing evaluations, generally pro bono. And, um, you know, they may be a schizophrenic patient who feels that they're hearing the voice of Satan or, or the FBI, or, you know, 
Vladimir Putin or, or whatever. So, uh, you know, there are people, of course, who have brain pathology and hear voices. There are other people who may have what we call multiple personality. We now call it dissociative identity disorder. And these people may somehow elaborate. It's it's kind of a um, um, suggestible phenomena uh, that they have a demonic personality. Um, again, that these kind of things, and even sociopaths, people who are preoccupied with evil, uh, all these people are not necessarily possessed. They they just have some character or psychiatric illness. And sure, I've seen thousands of those people. Uh, one, one of the reasons I think psychiatrists tend to be a little skeptical about these things Number one, psychiatrists as a whole, and there are many exceptions. I know many psychiatrists who agree with me 100%. But psychiatrists as a whole tend to be a little less open to traditional religion, number one. But number two, we all, uh, and I'm a board-certified American psychiatrist, uh, we all see these individuals who only imagine that they're attacked by an evil spirit. So... Your average uh, mental health professional often will overgeneralize and say, well, all these people are just deluded. Um, and again, my comeback is, look, um, you know, I'm getting reports of speaking perfect Latin. I'm getting reports of almost superhuman human strength. Sure, a few psychiatric patients who are manic can, you know, get a little violent and everything, but nothing, nothing at all like I see in a possessed person. So the I want to talk about the occult thing because they changed the definition of occult at some point. I, I want to ask you when you think it happened, but early 1900s, mid 1900s, maybe. But occult, you know, used to just mean hidden or secret. I mean, white magic used to be considered occult. The spirit, the theosophists, the spiritualists. I mean, that was all called a cult back then. Now it's it means evil. Like when you say a cult or occultism, people just think evil, black magic, you know. But I feel like we kind of need to distinguish between even when you talk about paganism and witchcraft. I mean, there's a white and a black, it seems to me. Like, shouldn't we be, you know, using black arts or black magic as that is what it really is? Um, you know, much of this new age stuff, paganism, yoga, meditation, should, shouldn't that fall under kind of like white magic? Well, you're making some distinctions that obviously people debate about. I mean, the word occult comes from the Latin word occultus. It means sort of hidden. You're right. Uh, there are going to be all kinds of debates about, you know, whether when you distinguish between white magic and black magic or spiritualism of different sorts, you know, how much of that is truly evil. But you still have to come up with an explanation for that. Now, I think it may, my view may differ a little bit from yours. I think that there are phenomena throughout history that is supernatural. Um, I don't want to get over into, you know, history and religious evidence, but, you know, I, I, I do believe in miracles. I do believe... <laughs> that uh, Jesus Christ rose from the dead and 500 people said they saw her, according to St. Paul. So I believe there have been these supernatural phenomena in history. But there have also been um, other phenomena that is clearly also, in quotes, spiritual of some sort, but may have a darker um, origin. Uh, traditionally, um, at least in, the, in Orthodox Christian theology, they distinguish between what was called supernatural and preternatural. Preternatural meaning beyond the natural. And that really included pretty much all the phenomena we now use by the term paranormal. Paranormal was a term that arose in the 19th century. And it, in my opinion, it's sort of a pseudoscientific term because it doesn't really talk about, well, what is the cause? So the question becomes, what do people think about non-supernatural phenomena, recognizing that there are supernatural spiritual phenomena too, that is not explained by 
something from the divine or something, then you have to you have to I think be open to the possibility that all this preternatural stuff, most of it, including in my opinion, and you may disagree with me on this, most spiritualist phenomena is in fact diabolic. Right, right. I mean that that sounds sort of fundamentalist to a lot of people. But my own feeling is that I mean I, I know uh, you know, I I have a friend who's a spiritualist, and uh, he and I disagree. Um, I know, and I've studied a lot of spiritualists, and it's always a little bit confusing, you know what I mean? And I, I think when you start to get into these confusing phenomena with some questionable teachings, you're starting to get into the realm of the the darker yeah, I mean, this is why I wanted to ask you about it, because I think it's worth trying to tease this apart a little bit, because we talk about all kinds of this spiritual practices on the show, including psychedelics and shaman, neo-shamanism, like you talk about, or or the other, you know, um, theosophy, spiritualism, that kind of stuff. And and I guess, to me, that was sort of the, the crux of the question is, let's assume that all the stuff that is obviously black magic you know, is the not good and it's diabolical, let's say, but what about the stuff that could be considered white magic? You know, the, the good witches, the, uh, the, I mean, it, it, the list goes on and on and on, right. Whether it's yoga, I mean, where do we draw the line? Is that still sort of risky? Like, so, especially us in our audience we're we are spiritual seekers after truth. And a lot of us are playing around with the spiritual stuff. Is that all risky? Like, where do we draw the line? Is there, or is there a line? Well, I think some of it, some of it is really risky, and I think people have to be very, very careful. What is the ultimate source of that stuff? Uh, I mean, in in my book, I wrote about a woman. She called herself a satanic high priestess, but for all intents and purposes, she was a witch. Now, she was a Satan worshiper. That's the obvious dark witch. Are there good witches? Well, uh, there may be. There may be people who are more benign in their intentions, but I still think that they're drawing their powers, if they're really a witch, they're drawing their powers from something darker. But let me get back to let me get back to the point you were making about spiritualism, because I think it kind of illustrates sort of what I'm trying to get at here. In the book, I wrote about a woman, uh, and all, all the names of these people, by the way, they're all real people, and I in the book, I mean, I wouldn't have written the book unless I I wrote, you know, incredibly accurate stories. You know, what's the point of writing a book, especially as a professor of psychiatry, if I'm not going to give very true details? So all the details are very true. The only thing I changed is the people's names, so they couldn't be identified. So I dealt with this woman. I think this will get back to your interesting question about, you know, different sorts of spiritualists. So I dealt with this woman, and she was a um, she was a devout Italian-American woman and a uh, housewife, you know, very devoted. And she came to me and she said, you know, Dr. Gallagher, um, I'm hearing the voices of angels. And again, at this point, I'm not sure... You know, maybe maybe the woman is schizophrenic or something. So, um, we need to pause. No, no, I'm I'm, I'm I remember the story, and it's yeah. it, this is kind of why I'm asking it. It's a great example. Yeah, yeah, I think it is a great example, which I think is is very um, striking to a lot of people who are into spiritualism, and, and I know and I know some of these people. Uh, we have interesting debates. <laughs> um, so this woman comes to me, and I said, well, you know, have you been checked out by another doctor? Have you tried any medication? She goes, yeah, and the doctors can't figure this out. That's why they sent me to you. So I talked to her, and I said, well, what are these angels telling you? And again, this was a very uh, unpretentious, um, good-hearted woman. And she says, well, they're telling me that God has some special mission for me. And I, I became convinced that this woman wasn't in any way crazy, that in fact she was absolutely hearing 
messages of angels, which are often, by the way, these kind of spiritualist messages are often different than than a psychotic person. You know, often, uh, I don't want to get into the weeds here, but generally uh, psychotic people will say, well, I hear this in my ear. Don't you hear it? Whereas spiritualists, as you probably know, tend to say, I'm getting a very strong message in my mind, you know. So, so again, I, I became convinced that she was not mentally ill, that she was getting these messages, but she interestingly had the humility to challenge the source because she says, I don't think God is sending me angels with a, a, a wonderful mission to the world. So I said, well, you know, work with this priest that she was working with and keep praying and see what happens. Um, so she comes back to me a month later and she says, you know, Dr. Gallagher, I think you suspected that there might be a change, and you were right. Now they're saying they're dead souls, that dead souls are speaking to me. The way mediums and spiritualists characteristically talk, you know, I'm in contact with Uncle Jimmy or Aunt Tilly, you know. And I said to her, and again, this was not a highly educated woman, but she kind of you know, knew her Bible, whatever. And she said, well, I'm a little skeptical of that, too, because I know that the Bible discourages summoning the spirits of uh, dead people, which it does. I mean, very much in books like Deuteronomy and Leviticus, uh, because that's that's a very common practice uh, in occultism. And did you say did you say summoning dead people or communicating? Well, both. Either one. Both? Summoning, summoning and... There's a pretty big difference there, you know, you'd think. Well, there's an overlap, though. You can understand yeah, yeah, that yeah, people yeah. summon because yeah. they want to communicate. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, okay. So anyway, long story short, I won't I won't beat the story to death. But um, a couple months later, she goes, Dr. Gallagher, they finally admitted who they are. And I said, what did they say? I suspected I knew. And she said, they say they are evil spirits who just were pretending to be angels and then pretending to be dead souls. Now, why did that resonate with me? It's because I'm not an exorcist. You know, I have to tell people that sometimes. I'm, I'm a humble doctor. I, I, I evaluate these people. Sometimes I go to the exorcisms just as an observer. And what I noticed in what I've noticed in many exorcisms, and other exorcists will report the same thing, obvious, is that you see a similar, you might say, progression. When people first get possessed, and this happens in all religions, and so this is, you know, people say, oh, only only fundamentalist Christians report possession. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's reported in all religions. I could give you some references on that if you want. And um a lot of times in these other religions, the the person will say, um, "Well, I'm, I'm I'm a god or a goddess. I'm Apollo." And I, I've seen, I've literally talked to a possessed guy who asked me, "You want to speak to Zeus? Zeus is Zeus is inside of me." So all throughout history, demons have essentially lied. They'll say, "I'm Zeus. I'm Apollo." I'm um, uh, Nero, you know, some de some evil deceased person. I'm Judas Iscariot. In my experience, these are all lies. Why? Because eventually, at least in the in the Christian tradition, when the exorcist forces the evil spirit, and these these are evil whatever they are, they're evil spirits because they're attacking and tormenting people, but. When the evil spirit is finally has to submit to the ministration of the exorcist, they're always forced to admit who they are. This is the whole business of, you know, we want the name of the exorcist. It's not so much that there's something magical about getting the name. What it shows, though, is at that point in the exorcism, the evil spirit is forced against their will not to lie anymore. In other words, they're forced, we would say by the power of God, or Christians would say by the power of our Lord, they are forced to reveal who they are. And that's a very good sign, 
Because what it means is, despite their efforts to lie, despite their efforts to hide themselves, which they will do as well, as best they can until they're forced not to, they've they've had to admit eventually who they are, and they admit that they're a demon. So, look, I mean, that's a pretty, in my opinion, strong evidence for the argument that people who claim to speak to spirits— including those who summon spirits, uh, which is essentially what a medium often does. Uh, they, they, in my, in my opinion, they're fooled by evil spirits. That can sound, that can sound kind of, you know, dogmatic or fundamental. No. But it's what I believe. Well, no, that, that's kind of what, no. I think I've gotten evidence for it. Yeah. I mean, this is a, this is a main thing that comes up all the time. That's why I really wanted to get your opinion on that. I mean, because we know friends, we have friends that are communicating with Egyptian gods or mother earth or all kinds of sort of de deatific or deific things. And, and then, you know, I've been out looking for UFOs before. So am I at risk because I'm asking to make contact with an ET? Like it, it just all falls. I mean, maybe that's where the line needs to be drawn is like, if you're not, and that's kind of where I've I've sort of drawn the line, putting the ET thing aside for now is making contact with anything, right? Like just like to me, it's safer to try and protect yourself, try and you know maybe even just practice manifestation or sort of you know typical sort of new age stuff. As long as you're not making contact with something else that you may well, not I, be able I, to trust. I think, I think your instinct is right at this point because I think making contact with these things. First of all, it can be dangerous. People, people, people can get harmed in the process. Uh, uh, but number two, you're dealing with creatures. I, I believe, you know, I believe in the um, traditional teaching about demons that they're fallen angels uh, who have rebelled against God and found their own place. Not a happy place, but you know, who the who the heck knows what exactly it's like. But uh, they do seem to want to confuse and torment those poor human beings uh, for their own reasons, some of which are sadistic. And remarkably, they have the ability to assume many different forms, even visibly, to some people, uh, not only dark shadows, but other stuff. And they, they, they have the proclivity to truly um, lie about who they are until they're forced not to, um, and that's that. That is my experience during exorcisms, unquestionably. So, what about so? So, I mean, maybe one level of safety is just staying very basic into like sort of mindfulness, meditation, um, relaxation, maybe manifestation, but not trying to communicate or summon anything. Well, that that certainly would be my recommendation. So, and, you know, look, I'm a psychiatrist, so I know I know people sometimes benefit from meditation. Oh, right? yeah, that, right. this, but you know that that's kind of on a naturalistic level. When you take those sort of things uh, to a level where you know you're seeking some kind of spirit guide or something like that, that's when I think people get in trouble, and and. And I'll be very honest with you, those people often wind up speaking to me because they a lot of them do get in trouble. Even chaos magic, I guess, would be one of those. If you're drawing sigils, putting intention into sigils, stuff like that. Different types of magic, absolutely. So it, this is why, I mean, honestly, it's... Um, uh, it's kind of difficult in a way because like you mentioned in your book as well, we've been sort of fighting against the scientism that's happened. I mean, we're stuck in this, this uh, materialistic world in a way, although many people just know that there's more to this than, than, than this materialism. So we're stuck in that. Then we're also coming from the dogma of the church. So there is this sort of proclivity to go towards something spiritual. What else? There's something else there, but we don't know what it is. Yeah, but there's always been that. There's always been that inclination in human nature to find something spiritual. I mean, I'm a, again, I'm a great lover of history and uh, um, studied the classics, and uh, I, I realized that there's nothing new under the sun, that people have always sought out something beyond the material world. And most people in history, by far, are hardly materialist. 
So in the modern age, um, even in America, there aren't that many dogmatic materialist you know, yeah but people, but they're people, running the show though though aren't they i mean aren't we in this materialistic paradigm right now i mean they're sort of whether we all believe it as a as a whole or not they're kind of running the show well again i would say yes and no uh you gotta you gotta remember modern science i mean you want to get very technical about it modern science is is uses the methods of what's called methodological naturalism in other words we we study things as if they're primarily have material causes and there are material causes you know i mean we believe in atoms and we believe in uh, gravity and all this stuff this is this is material phenomena and so uh, certainly in the western tradition accelerated in the enlightenment there's a tremendous advance of what we call science um but again, that doesn't really exclude. I mean, I regard I'm I'm a, I'm a physician, uh, you know. I regard myself as a scientist, but that doesn't mean that I or churches or your average commonsensical person is going to throw out all spirituality at the same time. Uh, it just it just is a different sort of evidence, you know. People people sometimes say to me things like, "Well, um, you know, let's do lab experiments on these uh, on these phenomena." As if an evil spirit is going to cooperate with a lab experiment. <laughs> it's, just, it's not going to happen. <laughs> and I'll tell you something that almost sounds too pat. I've had people videotape. Uh, I don't do it myself. The church discourages it um, as an invasion of privacy. But I've had people who, who, who have videotaped exorcism sessions, and they say, Gallagher, I got all this great evidence. I want to show you the tape. And they show me the tape, and <laughs> they say to me, oh, my God, the tape is blank. So wow. That's happened on a number of occasions. So, you know, it's interesting if you think about it. So evil spirits, they want to scare the crap out of some people, and they want to torment some people. But other people they want to hide from. And it's it's an it's almost like they have an individual strategy for everyone, and of course the famous uh, quote from the uh, French poet Baudelaire: "Satan's greatest trick is to pretend he doesn't exist." I, yeah. I, I believe that's the case, but you need a balance. I mean, I think you use the word balance, uh, which is oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I love about about your work. I mean. I've been reading a lot of books from the 1800s as well. The one I'm reading right now is from Cal Cajon. I, I don't know how to pronounce his name. It's the history of magic and witchcraft and, and animal magnetism. And, and I, I was thinking how relevant it seems in your, with your topic that, and you mentioned the history and how it's kind of come and gone into the mainstream belief system, whether possessions really exist or not. I mean, and I feel like something happened in the early 1900s or 1800s where, mesmer and animal magnetism became a, a reason to explain all this stuff away like so although they're saying hey there's this phenomena we recognize as super it was supernatural before now it's just it's animal magnetism you know uh hypnotism mesmer mesmerism whatever they were calling it back then and it was kind of a way to actually like slough off a lot of the uh accounts of possession i mean do you think that 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 harmed uh, our knowledge of it. Did the slow the slow down the belief? Because the other thing in the 1800s is they were still really pushing against materialism and the dogma of the church and spiritualism and theosophy was growing to the point where there was people like all over New York meeting and in these seances. Um, but do you think the possession narrative fell back quite a ways because of that discovery? Well, again, these are very good questions you're raising. I think. Because of the variety of human beings, you know, some people are religious, some people are not. You know, I mean, there's still a lot of religious people in our country. So it, it depends on the audience you're, you're, you're talking about. Yeah. But you're right that during the 19th, 19th century, 20th century, you know, the prestige of materialist science did become so powerful that it gave a people a kind of... Uh, purported explanation that there must be a material explanation for this stuff but i i, I will i will i will put, put your uh query this way 
Um, there are people who say, well, you know, Gallagher, you're a professor of psychiatry, you're a board-certified psychiatrist. How do you feel to be out of the mainstream? And this is what I always tell those people about. I say, what what mainstream are you talking about? <laughs> are you talking about the mainstream in America? Well, most people believe certainly in God, but they also believe in evil spirits. In fact, so are you talking about the mainstream in Madagascar or Haiti or la- the, the the large parts of the world? You know, my book was recently uh, translated into into um, Japanese. Because in East Asia, I mean, everybody believes in spirit. Well, I, I mean, I we kind of acknowledge that here. When I say mainstream, I mean Western civilization mainstream, like what's sort of driving Western civilization, you know, the paradigm of nothing supernatural is real, nothing paranormal is real, like that that kind of thing. Well, again, I, I would just say it's it's complicated because it's one paradigm among others. Sure. You know, in America, we think of uh, the bicoastal elites. You know, and uh, sure, there are a lot of there are a lot of materialists around, um, and science, certain mainstream science, does discourage um, sort of getting off into this paranormal stuff. In part, it's understandable. In part, because you cannot study this stuff in the same way. So what I what I like to say is the field that I'm involved in in terms of writing the book, you know, first of all, in, in my day to day practice, you know, prescribing medications and stuff like that, I'm relying on materialist science. Having said that, in the type of work we're talking about, evaluating, say, people with possession, it's not unscientific to rely on historical evidence. It's historical evidence. I mean, you you can't subject, you know, George Washington crossing the Delaware River to a lab experiment, but we all believe that that's a type of knowledge. What I think, and, and part of the reason I wrote the book is, I mean, I've been in a, a very unique position to have a tremendous experience, again, maybe more than any physician in history, with the historical evidence for this sort of thing. And I'm telling you, the evidence requires an explanation. And if you look at it, I say to people, well, these people, I mean, the first case I ever saw was a woman who claimed she was beaten up by evil spirits. I could find no medical explanation. And all these cases, possessions, oppressions, they're a kind of attack on a human being by what I believe are some kind of invisible spirits. Now, if that's not an evil spirit, I don't know what is. <laughs> They're a spirit that is attacking somebody. And again, I, I say to people, look, I wrote the book because I thought I had something to share with the public. But you don't have to take my word for it. Just read plenty of exorcists talk about their experience. In fact, the most famous book on possession was a guy about um, 100 years ago. He was a German professor named uh, Osterreich. Uh, Eventually, he got in trouble with the Nazis, uh, but he seemed to have survived. And he was an agnostic. And he originally felt, a la Freud, that all this possession stuff was hysteria and psychosis and stuff. But he was a careful scholar, and so he did a survey of all of world history, all cultures. And he said, you know, these possessions clearly involve he was he was a Paris he was a believer in parapsychology. So he said they all involved these non-material phenomena. And if you really examine the reports across culture, you will see that they all have a lot in common. And so he he basically saw possession as occurring through all cultures in history, number one, and number two, as a transcultural phenomena that probably had a single explanation, which certainly was on some level spiritual. With some of the same evidence going through all the things, talking in tongues, speaking different languages, um, extensive knowledge, unknown knowledge that you shouldn't have, um, exactly and those are and those levitation are the, all that kind those, of stuff spread those, out those are the kind of criteria you know and you need that you need that hard evidence now again an experienced exorcist is going to be able to pick up that evidence themselves 
in America, most of the bishops who have to, at least in the Catholic Church, who have to authorize a, a say, an exorcism, a major exorcism, uh, they're going to require very sound evidence. And you have to have evidence for the kind of things you just mentioned, uh, of the presence of a foreign spirit, like speaking foreign languages. I had a woman who uh, was was being... Uh, subject to deliverance prayers by a um, uh, a big, burly uh, guy like you, a uh, big, burly um, Lutheran deacon. And, you know, she, she was like 85 pounds soaking wet. She threw the guy across the room when the demon manifested itself. So you have to have evidence of that. You normally also have to have a plausible history. So this is where we go back to how does— who does this happen to? You know, in some ways, for a possession, either wittingly or unwittingly, you are inviting the demon in, in some ways, opening a doorway, as it's often put. For instance, the woman I write about in the longest chapter of my book was this Julia. Uh, again, not a real name. Everything else in that chapter is true. She was a Satanist. And, and again, you know, I was brought up in the era of the satanic panic. I'm not someone who sees Satan. It's all over the place. But this was the real deal. Was she the breeder? She was the breeder? Uh, as a matter of fact, she was. Which, again, I think is quite rare. Um, she used to justify it because she would say, well, abortion is legal. I just have these, these fetuses aborted. But she felt that she was pleasing Satan by doing that. She felt like she got a lot of powers in return, which she did. I mean, she demonstrated a number of parapsychological powers directly to me. And she was clearly possessed, which she knew she was possessed, because um, of different phenomena. And um, But clearly it happened to her because she worshipped Satan. Another guy I write in the book, a guy called Juan, was a drug lord. And he had turned to one of these Mexican uh, devil cults, Santa Muerte. And he said, man, I got all I wanted, all the girls I wanted, all the cars I wanted. I was really on top of the world until he wasn't. And he got arrested. Uh, the prison chaplain, you know, diagnosed that he was possessed. And um, it was obvious that his turning to this occultism as well as evil ways, uh, he, he was, you know, not Mother Teresa, put it that way, uh, he, um, you know, he had opened himself up to possession as well. How much would our just pure intention not, that this would not affect us? Like, what if I just had the most utter confidence that I would never be possessed? Not that I would dabble in any of that black arts, but just in, in normal, like, circumstances, just the, just the confidence or intention that I, would that be enough to protect me, do you think? I mean, I think if you were a decent person, yes, you would be protected. You know, if you had turned to something very evil, um, then you would be opening yourself up. You you also do a balanced job at at talking talking about Julia and how she was the breeder, and they used to use the fetus for for their sacrifices and their rituals and stuff like that. And you talk about the you know the Martin case and the Satanic Panic and and. Um, and you also mentioned, though, how it is overblown in the media, and especially uh, last few years, there's been a lot of conspiracies about uh, pedo empire. I mean, um, you know, there's a lot of people that think that this is a, you know, a global child trafficking ring, satanic, sacrificing kids and stuff like that. Um, but you have a pretty balanced view of that, too, right? A lot of that is kind of uh, yeah, exaggeration, that stuff, misinformation. I think, I think like that stuff is exaggerated. I mean, like the QAnon uh, controversy. I mean, I think that's all conspiracy theories, exaggeration. It doesn't mean there aren't a few of those cases, a few of those cases uh, around. There, there was a there was a period, and 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 sometimes, you know, I guess you could call them unscrupulous authors have written books about this stuff, and they've just made up things. You know, I mean, my book, every fact in my book is true. Yeah, yeah. People just make up these stories to, yeah. sell, to sell books. Uh, and I remember I remember when the satanic panic that we've both referred to uh, was at its height 30, 30 years ago or so. You know, people would people would argue, well, uh, there are 50,000 
kids in America who have been kidnapped and potentially sacrificed by Satanists. Well, there weren't there were there weren't fifty thousand missing children in the country in the whole country, and and we knew that the vast majority of them were kind of runaways and stuff. So, yes, when when the uh, the first priest who came to me who asked my help because I always mention I never volunteered for any of this stuff. Everything I've done, I've been asked to do, and uh, including write a book and join join the international association involved with this. Um, and I said, I said to him, "Look, Father, with all due respect, I'm a little skeptical of a lot of what you're talking about." And he said, "Well, then you're the perfect man for the job," because he wanted someone who was went into it with skepticism. Well, there's been, I mean, we've heard over the years, there's been uh, a huge increase in Catholic exorcisms and people being hired for the job in Italy. Like, like, I mean, I remember hearing crazy stats about the increase of, of this going on. And so I guess the question for you would be, is this um, overblown again? Like, is it just because of, of all these sort of uh, almost fake, not fake in a in a, a bad way, but just false cases, I guess you could say. Or is there a real increase in real possessions? And and what about the satanic? Well, actually, I'll, I'll leave that second part of the question for after. Well, it's a very good question. I think that there is exaggeration. Um, I also think there's always been a certain amount of this stuff, and you always need well-trained people who can sort out uh, the true from the false. So it is true that there are a lot more exorcists. Um, and, you know, I don't know that they're really overworked. I mean, I think that they are involved in assessing these cases. Now, there certainly are people who see it everywhere. Do you, do you think, think it's an I think, increase? I think, I think what has really happened is because of the media and because of the open discussion of this, uh, it's become more common for people to think that they're affected by something demonic when they're not. And so they they obviously are seeking out experts to uh, to help them with it, and, and we need well-trained experts to help them with it and, and not over-diagnose them. So, so would you say, I mean, I really kind of, I want to... Uh to go a little deeper on this, would you say that actual possessions, if you were to just totally guess, speculate like actual possessions or, or evil spirits possessing people, would that be increasing in the last hundred years, let's say compared to history? Like if you were just to guess, well, first of all, there are, there have been cultures which are pretty dark and, you know, um, like real sacrifices, the Mayans, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Carthaginians, the Aztecs. I think that those cultures had a lot of demonic phenomena. Uh, I think in the Western world, um, as traditional religions, which I may be more sympathetic to than you, uh, traditional religions, as they've declined, I think there are more people who have turned to alternative yeah. beliefs that are sometimes dark. So you ask for my guess. It is a guess. I think it's very hard to prove this stuff. I think there are probably more people who are attacked in different ways, including oppressions, and probably a few more people who are possessed because they're so alienated from a healthier spirituality. Does the does the the overt satanic symbolism in pop culture like affect this? Have anything to do with it? I mean, you can see now yeah, these like these celebrities, these musicians. I mean, they're just putting it right in our face now. There's no longer like hidden symbolism in places. They're just throwing it out there. Yeah, I mean, I think that can be exaggerated too, in the sense that you know, some people say to me, "Well, what about the Harry Potter books?" You know, I I have I have a, a nephew who's you know. A, really solid Christian intellectual guy. He grew up on the Harry Potter books, you know. So I think that certain of that stuff can get exaggerated. But when it when it shades into, you know, satanic music and pentagrams, yeah, I, I, I do think that's uh, dangerous stuff. We, I got an article here from yesterday from our uh, our our country here. I wanted to get your your take on it because it was uh, good timing. So there's a court ruling that fails to resolve the issue of coercive imposition of spiritual practices on children. So this is from Vancouver. 
And I guess there was a position of the Justice Center of, for Constitutional Freedoms here that imposing supernatural or spiritual practices on public school children without parental notification and parental consent and without even the right for students to opt out is a matter of substantial public concern. So there's this school, I guess, that's been doing uh, um, Aboriginal practices, culture being taught in school, providing rig- religious rituals and spiritual ceremonies. I think they're even doing like um, uh, cleansing the spirits of kids, like doing smudging and actually saying to the kids that we're cleansing the spirits of you, uh, from you. <laughs> yeah, I, I would be pretty... Uh pretty opposed to allowing uh, a couple of schools to do that with a kid of mine, you know? <clears throat> yeah. Does it surprise you that they're doing it at all? Hey, you know, the cultures, I mean, look, I'm a, I'm a great lover of history and, you know, every age in history has its craziness and we certainly have our share. Do you think it's going to, do you think it could come to a head? Um, not really. I think it's perennial. I think these things, you know, go in cycles in history. I mean, that's my own view. I mean, you know, we, we say we, we live in a decadent culture. Well, you know, the Roman Empire descended into decadism. You know, the Aztecs sacrificed women and children. So, you know, is history getting better? Is it getting worse? I mean, you know, it depends, you know. It's probably doing both at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. I want to mention, before I forget to ask you this, I I really want, we talk about synchronicities on the show all the time, and you didn't call it a synchronicity in your book, but the ending of your book with the, uh, with the names of the, of the demons, can you talk about that process of like uh, the, and what happened with that? Did you know which one I'm talking about? Yeah, sure. Uh, I wrote the book, so I know what (laughs) you I didn't know if I described it good enough or. So, long story short, you know, this um, uh, woman comes to to me. Uh, she was actually from the Carolinas, and uh, she claimed that she was involved with a, a brujo, you know, sort of a uh, Hispanic term for a wizard, and that he gave her a coin. Uh, he was he was an occultist, and he gave her a, a token that on one side um, had the name um, of a of a demon, um, Scalius, whom I had already encountered, I guess you could say. Well, I guess, yeah, I mean, whether it was true or not, I hadn't, I hadn't encountered a possession where this woman said, the demon spoke through her and said his name was Scalius. Now, this was like, you know, a thousand miles apart. This woman shows me this token with the name Scalius. And then on the other side of the token, it has from this wizard, who was some kind of dark figure, it has the word broccoli. So I said to her, well, you don't like broccoli or what? You know, <laughs> because I have no idea. Literally, a couple of weeks later, this is how I end the book, because I thought it was a pretty dramatic story. Um, This um, Hispanic woman brings her 12-year-old son to me, and um, he had some odd phenomena. I mean, I won't go into all the detail, but I I thought he had a demonic oppression. And I I said that to the woman. And uh, he claimed that a demon was giving him messages. 12-year-old kid. And I I really didn't think to ask the name, but, you know, as the kid is leaving my office, I said to him, uh, by the way, did the demon ever tell you what his name was? And he says, broccoli. (laughs) I mean, you know, whether you call it synchronicity or I would call it probably some effort to scare the crap out of Dr. Gallagher, uh, you know, I was I was witnessing something pretty weird, if you think about it. Um, by that point, I'm I'm pretty phlegmatic about the whole subject, and I wasn't I wasn't phased too much. But it did strike me as amazing that it's it's like 
these evil spirits, I mean, they knew they knew something about my life, but they knew, but they they seem to know. I know it sounds quite, sort of um, scary, but they seem to know about all of us. And they yeah, you, yeah, you kind of mentioned well, that. That, that, that was the that, point. That was the point of the, my telling the story. Yeah, yeah, they, they they're sort of they they are there. They are watching. They know about us. They know what's going on. Yeah. Absolutely. It gives me. It gives me real. It really makes me wonder about the like the last couple thousand years with the churches, and I mean, it, it does make me think. No wonder why there was some overreactions with stuff. You know, if they experienced a real case at whatever point in history, I mean, you would be, you know, really concerned that this is happening. I mean, you can see. And I'm not making excuses for the Catholic Church sort of demonizing any kind of practice outside of their own religion, but. You can see why there was some overreactions back then, you know? Well, there's always going to be overreactions. I mean, if you if you look at almost any cultural phenomenon, there's going to be overreactions, and there's going to be people who are in, in, in denial. That's why I also uh, like the quote from C.S. Lewis, who was... C.S. Lewis was a very um, intelligent guy, and he was very well read, and he he knew a fair amount about the demonic realm, in my opinion. And his his famous quote is, uh, demons would like us either to ignore them as if they don't exist or to become over preoccupied with them and ascribe too much power to them. You know, I mean, the old uh, Flip Wilson, if you remember, the devil made me do it. I, I don't believe that. People have free will. So you can exaggerate the effect of these evil spirits. Um, but an equal error, as Lewis pointed out, is to act is to ignore them as if they don't exist. And I think either either extreme is bad. And as you're pointing out in history, it's very easy for different cultural errors. Going back to your question, uh, the question from your colleague, you know, there's always going to be um, back and forth between some cultural phenomena that get exaggerated and other cultural phenomena that may that may be improving in some ways, you know. Is there a genetic ancestral component to any of these possessions at all? Do you see them through lineage? Another very good question, who I, which I think has a complicated answer. I think that that can get exaggerated, too. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm not saying that there isn't some possibility, but in my experience, um, you know, somebody may have a grandmother who's a witch or something and put a curse on them. I mean, I think there is some of that stuff, but I, I think it gets exaggerated. I remember dealing with a woman who was possessed. She was a young woman. And, uh, you know, her, her parents, who were these kind of aristocratic uh, Hispanic type, uh, they um, said to me, well, we know why we know why our daughter is suffering. Uh, we know why this happened to our daughter. It's because her great grandfather was a was a Mason. Now you know there 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 can be a story about Mason, Masons too. And I, I mentioned I mentioned this theory of the parents to the daughter who was possessed, and she goes, "That's that's a bunch of nonsense. The reason I'm possessed is because I spent five or six years dealing with the occult." With a Ouija board or something, but, yeah, but, you know, stuff like that. But she never told her parents that, you know? right? <laughs> That's so her parents a great were saying, you know, our poor daughter, the victim. You know, there must have been there must have been something in our lineage when, in fact, that was not the case at all. Has it ever? Has it ever? Do you think hidden or hidden itself in other phenomena in the past? Like you hear people trying to make this syncretic connection with elves and fairies and jinn and ETs and all this—that it's all sort of some similar phenomena. Would you say it's separate to some of that other myth, mythological or folklore? Well, uh, I did mention earlier that the amazing thing about evil spirits is number one, they lie who they are. So they say they were all kinds of things like Zeus. You know, I literally had a guy who I knew was possessed and he wanted me to speak to Zeus. I declined by the way. And they also can appear in all amazingly different forms. In other words, they have their spirits, but they have some ability to appear in material form. And yeah. obviously Obviously, when they attack people, they're they're affecting material reality. Yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't put it past 
a lot of phenomena in history having been sort of demonic tricks. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The big the trickster element in it. Yeah, that's. And that seems to be their satisfaction. They like tricking us. Yeah. Uh, in in the case of uh, that Julia woman. I'll always, I always tell the story that when I first heard the demonic voice from her, it said to the priest, I was riding in the car with a priest, she goes into this trance, and the demonic voice says, uh, some of it is uh, vulgar, but it, well, I'll, I'll give you the short part. Oh, you don't have to worry about that here, yeah. <laughs> so I said, uh, so the demon says, uh, I told I told you to leave her leave her alone, you effing priest, you monkey priest. And I I've always thought that's sort of how evil spirits think of us. They think of it as we're like dogs to them. You know, we're like pets. We're monkeys. We're evolved monkeys, and that's why why shouldn't they have fun with us by tormenting us? Which may be one of their biggest pleasures. Of course, their ultimate aim, we think, is to um, attack God. They really can't attack God, so they'll attack human beings made in the image of God um, because they're, you know, they're, they, chose, they chose their journey, so to speak. But on the other hand, they still resent it, and they, they, they seem to resent and continue to rebel against God. Is there still good, good angels up there too, Michael and Raphael and all them? Absolutely. <laughs> do do you do people contact the the good angels for assistance or for protection? I mean, is that okay to make that kind of contact? Like, yeah, of course. Yeah, oh. yeah. It's fuck. It's such yeah, a I fascinating. Think people, I think people have have legitimately talked to saints and stuff like that. Uh, so there is the realm of uh, of the supernatural. What what I what I think? I mean, I remember some observer saying this, and I sort of rang true to me. That um, and there are all these false angel sightings too. Whereas I think they're they're demonic tricks. But uh, they said the the evil spirits want to sort of like a narcissistic person. They want to make themselves known. They want to cause commotion. They want to. Whereas the angels, they don't really care. They help us. They do God's will. But they don't need to. They don't need to. They don't want the publicity. They, yeah. They don't, they don't need the publicity. <laughs> <laughs> Darren, do you have any comments or, or thoughts? How much uh how how much does possession manifest as mental illness? Well, I, I draw a major distinction. You know, I mean I I I think that people who are possessed by and large, I'm not saying, you know, if you if if you're possessed, you can get depressed, trust me. But by and large, if you're possessed, you're possessed. You don't have mental illness, and most, the vast majority of mental illness, you know, they don't they don't have anything demonic or anything overtly demonic. You know, I I, I write in the book about a, a famous exorcist who I met on a couple of occasions. His name is Malachi Martin, and Martin was he was he was a uh, interesting character, uh, very very erudite guy who claim that half the people in psychiatric hospitals were possessed. I mean, I, I think that's nonsense. Everybody will remember him from Art Bell. He used to be on Art Bell all the time. Yeah, Bell, Bell, uh, Bell apparently uh, liked my work, too. You know, he knew, I knew, Art, I knew Art Bell a little bit, and, uh, you know, his successor, George Inouye. Well, Dr. Gallagher, thanks for coming on the show. Where can people get the book? Well, b- oh, before we ahead. do that, is there anything that you think we need oh, I to, forgot about that we that. missed? <laughs> I think I mean the one thing the one thing you talked about magic and you know I think it's important to realize that exorcisms are sort of an opposite genre they're not magic they're prayers and and any good exorcist is going to say it's not me the exorcist who's delivering the person it's god or our lord and the other thing that Hollywood gets wrong, and Hollywood is approaching me about the book, trust me, but the other thing that Hollywood gets wrong is that they they don't understand that the, the victim 
has to reform their lives. And that's an integral part of the process. So it's sort of the opposite of magic. You know, you're not going to a witch doctor and you take this herb and everything will be fine. You're going to somebody who's going to pray for you, for our Lord to deliver you, but you also have to work at it. You have to, in a way, make yourself, as one exorcist uh, put it, you have to make yourself inhospitable to the evil spirits. You have to reform your life. So, for instance, with the woman, the high priestess, Julia, she was never delivered because she never left the cult. I mean, she was, in part, it was a tragedy because she was afraid of the cult. She was afraid that the cult was going to harm her if she turned to the church. Whereas the other guy I mentioned, this drug lord, Juan, he completely reformed his life. He returned back to his religious upbringing, worked at it, and he was and he was delivered. Where's so that, the- that's, that's an important distinction to make, that, you know, it's not, it's not magic. You're not, you go to an exorcist, you're not going to, to, to magic. Sort of like going to a psychiatrist. People want the magic pill. I tell people, these pills may help you. There's no magic. you got to work at it, too. And then the magic happens. <laughs> well, we hope. Where magic can people comes- get the book? Is there a better spot to get it than others? Can they get signed copies? You actually, it's interesting you say that because uh, there is a press called Griffin Press uh, that has signed copies available. It's kind of like one of these deluxe editions. Um, The book is going to be translated in Spanish soon, by the way, too. Uh, I mean, I think it's available in most bookstores. It's certainly available from HarperCollins, and I'm, I'm grateful for HarperCollins, even though, trust me, they, they, they make most of the money out of this book. I don't... Uh, because they let me write the book I wanted to write, but like like all these you know major publishers, uh, you can easily get it on Amazon. The audio version is very good because um, um, a guy a guy I'm having dinner with <laughs> tomorrow night is a good friend of mine. He's a Shakespearean actor, and he did the audio version of the book. And uh, I think Amazon has some deal. You know, if you sign up for whatever service they're offering, you can get the book, the audio book for free. Yep. yep. He's, he's done a great job. Everybody who, who has the audio version says to me, man, that guy did a great job. Yeah. He did a really good job. Yeah. It's, um, is it good? Are you happy with the release so far? Yeah. I mean, I sold a fair amount of books, you know, religious books and serious books like this, they don't sell too many books, but I've sold a lot of books. And, um, you know, I alluded to that uh, there is going to be a Hollywood movie made out of the book. Be careful with those guys in Hollywood. Make sure you keep some rights over that or like some creative control. I mean, they'll just. You know know what I tell people? Uh, I tell people uh, I I better be careful about what I wish for. But again, it, it just sort of came to me. I felt I shouldn't turn it down. And I did insist that I'm executive producer. So Okay, good. Yeah. Well, that's great. That I'll, I'll watch that movie. Yeah, this has been. This uh, you know, been... doing the movie. I'm sure you guys are aware of the name. Uh, is a uh, to to use a New York Yiddish term. He's a he's a big uh, Hollywood mocker uh, producer, Jason Blum. All right, good. Oh, wow. Well, well, he's a pretty big shot. So uh, yeah. he told me when he told me when I met him. I met him in his uh, townhouse in Brooklyn Heights, nice area of. Uh, um, Brooklyn, obviously. He said, Dr. Gallagher, this is the hottest intellectual property I've ever seen. Wow. wow. Isn't that an amazing comment? So I, t- I, I liked it. I really liked the book. I recommend it. I mean, it's it really, like, it touches on all kinds of stuff we talk about on this show, and, and it's just, it's really, I think it's a really important piece of work for uh, for that nuanced, balanced opinion. I mean, it's a complex subject. It really is one of the most interesting things because it's, it's out there, but how do we just stay, you know, and not in constant fear of these things, you know, and, and, and protect ourselves by not, you know, going into realms that we shouldn't go into. Oh, we, we should protect, we should protect ourselves. I'm, I'm enough yeah. of a Christian guys that, you know, I say the ultimate, the ultimate victory is ours, but it, it's, a, it is a sobering, it is a sobering uh, subject, but I'm, I'm not out to scare people. You, you take care of yourself. Don't uh, don't turn to anything evil and dark in your life. 
Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. This has been great. Dr. Robert Gallagher, thanks for coming on the show. Come back after the movie comes out. Don't forget about us. Hey, I won't forget about you. All I need is another invitation. You take Run care. It on. Okay, thanks. It was nice to have such a thoughtful interview with you guys. So I Awesome. Think- thanks. Thanks, buddy. Awesome. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. And that was a chat with Dr. Richard Richard Gallagher. Dr. Richard Gallagher. <laughs> What'd you think? That was a good one. Seems like you were uh, you're pretty dialed in. I let you run with the oh, ball there. You read yeah, the book. I know, I know. I just that's why I want to come back to you every once in a while if I've had my time. But you know, you I know you can jump in any time. But you know, I did have a list of stuff I want to talk to him about, and I mean, it has so much to do with the with the books I'm reading right now. And I, I just, oh man, it's I have a hard time with the occult thing and the and the paganism, right? And I didn't even know he was a, a Catholic. Actually, he doesn't really talk about that in the book, so it doesn't come across like a religious book. It comes across like a scientific book, but it still bugs me that they, how a cult is, is, uh, is being used as evil, you know? That's how they get you. Oh, it's all changed, man. It's just, it's weird. Cause I'm reading Manly P Hall's book, right. For, uh, for our other show outlawed. And they talk about a cult as if it's nothing, right? I mean, it's not evil in the a hundred years ago. It wasn't evil. Now it is. Well, even just in like, since we started the show, it's become more evil. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That's what I'm talking about. Exactly. Sons of bitches. Big thanks to Dr. Gallagher for coming on the show. Big thanks to you guys for listening. Even bigger thanks if you're one of the people who choose support to support our work. If you're not, maybe you can choose to do that this week. Christmas is coming. America.ca slash support. Maybe sign up for a monthly or make a Christmas donation. Whatever you can do to help lube the wheels of the podcast gears over here is greatly appreciated. You can check out our other podcast, GreatAmericaOutlaw.ca, if you want to check out the more controversial stuff. I think we got like uh, Adam Curry's coming on this show next week, and we got Randall Carlson and some great shows coming up. GreatAmericaOutlaw.ca on this show, America.ca slash support. We got all the audio books over at AdultBrain.ca. We got Magic on the Mountain coming up. Head over to ContactOfTheCabin.com. Check that out. I think that's about it. Other than that, we love you guys. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week. Baby, you're just a single solitary drop in the bucket, baby. You're just a drop in the bucket, baby. You're just a single solitary drop in the bucket, baby. I'll be 
a poet today Sketch out the scenery Rambling from here and there and back and forth between here and there and back and forth between here and there and to the corner store The sunrise corner store Sunrise Corner Store The Sunrise Corner Store Pinching pennies La da 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 Myself a dog to be my best friend. 